you're a veteran, on behalf of WCC, we just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Um, and if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you're a uh, friend uh, of one, I just want to say thank you for supporting. Thank you for encouraging them. Because the battle that they fought it doesn't end when they come back. And uh, tomorrow, just please reach out, show some veterans your love. With that said, I want to say good morning, church. Now, what do I mean by good morning? You know, I've always loved that quote from Gandalf in The Hobbit. You know, if you haven't noticed, it's not really a sermon from Austin unless I quote Lord of the Rings. But uh, let me read a little dialogue from the book. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining, and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning, whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning, or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo. I love it because it's such a simple question, uh, but not so simple at the same time, right? We say it every day, but what does it mean? Well, it, it depends on your perspective. And in this world, you know, we have an overwhelming amount of perspectives to choose from. And the task of finding the right perspective, well, it's, it's kind of daunting, right? It's terrifying. And this is especially true when we look at history. Um, if your perspective doesn't really line up with mainstream, what do we see in history? Well, we see time and time again that people's immediate gut reaction, it's usually not open arms, right? Um, it's usually hatred, violence, social outcasting, something of that nature. And in my experience, the people who claim to be the most open-minded have become some of the biggest hypocrites most times and are usually the ones that are unable to tolerate others that have just a different perspective. And that makes my blood boil. It makes my blood boil when it's me that, that does that. And before you start nodding your head like you're not one of those, just please don't. Not until you've really done some serious, objective, unbiased self-reflection. Because the church, you know, it has a record in history of some pretty dumb and violent acts. But to be fair, you know, this is not a reflection on Scripture, right? But this is rather ignorant men and women in history who acted upon false perspectives that I seem to can't find anywhere in Scripture. And so... Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today is these perspectives. Because whether they're true or whether they're false, perspectives have consequences, right? And why is that? Well, it's because they shape our reality, right? They shape our actions. They shape our value that we see in one another because perspectives have power. Pythagoras, an early Greek philosopher, was one of the first to propose that the earth was round. And Aristotle was the one who later proved it. I can guarantee you people back then did not react lovingly to having their foundational beliefs questioned. And uh, one of the perspectives I love to share is the perspective of how plants grew in the early world. You know, it wasn't until the 1700s that photosynthesis became theorized. And then it wasn't until around the mid-1800s that it kind of solidified into an actual discovery. It took mankind this long to figure out that plants needed light to grow. <laughs> I just find that hilarious. You know what the worldwide belief was of how plants grew? It was that their roots consumed the dirt. Um, that's how they grew. They consumed the dirt. And in fact, when experimenting with photosynthesis, and they were doing this, these studies, and they noticed that during extended periods of darkness, the plants were dying, their first thought was not, huh, must be the light. You know what it was? They actually thought at first that it was these plants during these periods of darkness, they must emit this toxic gas that kills off all the other plants. It's pretty funny we laugh at that now. But, you know, or think about the perspective during Galileo's life. An amazing Christian scientist, definitely changed the world. He was the first one to invent a telescope in 1609, which greatly changed his perspective, literally, and then the world's. And in that time, people believed that the moon was perfectly smooth. Um, but Galileo, with aid of his telescope, he discovered, no, hey, there's craters and mountains on the moon. Uh, he later turned his gaze towards Venus, the brightest celestial object in the sky besides the sun and moon. And with his observation of the phases of Venus and looking also at Jupiter's moons, he was able to conclude that it sure seems like everything in our solar system is revolving around the sun, not the earth, which was the common perspective at the time. He also later damaged his eyesight, not realizing that looking at the sun and the sunspots would damage his eyesight. Uh, but his discoveries, they changed the world. And these are just, you know, a handful of thousands of examples we could look in history and, and, and get. But what I've noticed is that each time, each generation, every single one, they always thought they had it right. They thought they understood. And they'd often even put to death or socially ridicule anyone who challenged it. I think we can kind of see that today as well. And so my question is, what is up with this arrogance? Why do we put so much faith in mankind? I mean, when we can look at every single generation and point out mind-blowing changes to the perspectives of that time. Here in the 21st century, I'm just curious. 
Are we going to do the same thing and repeat the same flaw that every generation has done before us? Not just thinking that we're right. That's just one thing. But the arrogance of, of that couples with it, it's not just to do with things of science, things of faith. Because, you know, I've heard uh, not just things of science, but also things of faith. Because I've heard some ridiculous and some really bad streaks of arrogance in church folk before, and myself included. And with me personally, this arrogance, it usually wasn't even based in things that were like solid, undisputable truths in Scripture. They're actually usually like my opinions on some gray areas. And uh, they're usually based in something that had a lot more wiggle room than when I had first realized. However, there are many perspectives in our faith, right, uh, that are not questionable. You either have to accept them or deny them. There isn't wiggle room. And what I love about Christianity is it's okay to have questions. Our leadership here is not afraid of questions. We love questions. It's a sign that you're growing in your faith. And it's okay to be unsure about some things. It's okay for a lot of these gray areas to have varying opinions, as long as you remember that they're opinions. Um, but and I, when I look at Christians, I get the passion, though. I get, in a sense, I get their arrogance, I guess I would say. Even if they're just plain wrong, I get it. Because their confidence, they're trusting in a higher intellect, the authority of God and God's perspective. And sometimes we go too far as church people in those assumptions. But what I don't get, and maybe you guys can help me out, is I don't get the arrogance of the secular world. I don't get the arrogance in the world's ability to interpret the universe because we're always proving ourselves wrong. So trust me, guys. I don't want you to take this away and say I'm dissing science because, you know, I love science. I really do. It's one of my favorite subjects. But I don't think it's in conflict with our faith as so many think today. However, there is a difference in the sciences that I want to point out, a difference in perspective that I think is really, really important for us to grasp, and that's the difference between observable science and historical science. So, observable science, love it. You know, it's, it's, it's the practice of observation, testing, experiments. Love it. No problem there. Because uh, whether you're secular, whether you're Christian, guess what? We've all got the same data to look at. You know, we've got the same decay rates, the same formulas, the same uh, data, but historical science... That's different. Uh, that's not so solid because it's based in a time when we weren't there, one, right? But it's also where our worldviews come into play. And what we've seen is that our worldviews can really, really affect how we look and interpret this data. And so historical science is kind of where we have that pushback in our faith because our perspectives, what? They greatly influence how we interpret the data. However, in every other time but ours, guess what? There wasn't a divide between science and faith. In fact, our history is filled with Christian scientists who changed the world, scientists who didn't have to choose. You know, we've got Copernicus, Isaac Newton with the natural laws and gravity, Kelvin with the temperature scale that we still use today, Thurman who discovered electrons. I could go on and on, but our history is filled with Christians, scientists who didn't have to choose. And so what's changed in the 21st century? You know, and a lot of things, and really that's a sermon for another day. But basically, there was a perspective shift. Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case because Faith and science, just want to throw this last one out there, they don't, they're not, uh, they don't have to be in conflict. They just have different goals. Science explains the how. We get that. We understand that. But faith is different. Genesis explains the who. It's not looking to explain the how of every little biology textbook with every detail. It's looking to explain the who. And science can aid our faith because by studying the how, we can better understand the who. Many people, including myself, uh, we don't like to think that we might be brainwashed. But... Here's the truth, guys. We all are, in a sense. We all have been shaped and molded by people in our society by other perspectives. Whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want it or not, we've been shaped by others, uh, by our world, by our classes, by our teachers, by our friends. You know, we've been shaped, and a lot of times it's subconscious. And sometimes, if you really try to think about it, it's almost kind of hard to think of an original perspective or discovery or something you found out all on your own. You know, because a lot of times we just kind of adopted it from somewhere else. And that's kind of scary, if you ask me. So... I don't care how old you are. I want, you, I want to challenge you to revisit the foundations of everything you think you know. I know that's a big homework assignment, right? Uh, because often, though, our biggest flaws in our thinking, it's not in what we think we know. You know, it's in what we know we know. That's usually where our biggest uh, flaws are at. And personally, I don't want that for you guys. I don't want that for myself. Because to boil it down to one statement, what the heck does man really know? I mean, our textbooks are always changing. They're changing faster than ever before. And for me personally, I've just, I've kind of gotten over putting my faith in man because I've seen the folly in it. I just don't want any perspective or the popular one at the time. I want the right one. I want one that doesn't change. Because are we really that wise? And if so, why can't I control my own diet? I mean, we can't even govern our own hearts and lives. We make boneheaded decisions or mistakes every day. 
we're terrible kings over our kingdoms, I would say at least. And uh, so what makes us think we're so wise? I think it partially has to do with the fact that our greatest known intellectual rival in the order of creation, you know, is a crow, a chimp, or a dolphin. But uh, is there something else that we can put our faith in? Something other than man, something other than dolphins? If only there was some divine revelation of a reality, if only we had God's perspective, one that doesn't change, that would be intriguing to analyze and look at, right, guys? Bible, right? <laughs> okay. All right, guys, stay with me, stay awake. All right, so when we look at God's perspective, though, it's clear that the purpose of this life is what? It's finding and being in a relationship with him. But there's also another huge component, and that is you guys have to make a choice. You have to pick a side in this life. Your perspective, it determines your pursuit. It determines your worldview. Your perspective is like the rudder on a ship that sets the course for your eternal destiny. And I just want to say this. The huge claims that are in Scripture, they're not something to fall asleep over in church, okay? They're worth your time to investigate. And not just something you did when you were 18. Every day, you need to, you need to thoroughly weigh the evidence. It's worth your time to investigate. And I have to admit, I feel a little crazy sometimes, most times, if I'm being honest, because when I take a step back, and I kind of just observe the world, I realize, man, I have such a different perspective than most people. And it's not because I'm smarter than everyone else. It's not because it's something I dreamed up on my own, you know. It's because I've weighed the evidence all around me, and I've picked a side. I've chosen a worldview, and here's the kicker. I've let it change me. I've decided that if there is truth out there, for me, it's just the best track record isn't mankind's. You know, it's not an empty claim. Just look at our history. It's backed up by tons of evidence. But, uh, you know, it's like, kind of like we're like two-year-olds in a calculus class. You know, we can recognize the letters from the alphabet and the formula. Oh, yeah, that's the number one, that's number two. We can do that. But I feel like we can't see how it all comes together. We just don't have the computing power for that, at least right now. And so based on the evidence, on the perspective that makes the most sense to me, it's God's. I know that's a shocking thing for a youth minister to say, right? But uh, from Scripture, we see that there's more to this world than meets the eye. Like when you're looking at your computer, you know, you see uh, the wallpaper, you see the icons. But if you know a little bit about computers, you know, that's not really the reality of what's going on, right? There's a lot of things in the background unseen. There's thousands of pixels that are making up those images. There's, you know, complex coding of zeros and ones and computer processes that are work. The reality of what's going on, despite it's unseen, is much different than what we see. And I think the same is with our world. We see the wallpaper, you know, the icons of our world. We don't really ever stop to think about all the unseen components that are shaping our really, our, really our, our reality. So, Ken Ham, whether you love him, whether you hate him, you know, he really boils it down to one simple statement I've always loved. And that is, you either believe man's word or you believe God's word. And I would just add one little tiny teeny letter to that statement, the letter L. You either believe man's world or you believe God's world. Because depending on which word you trust, it determines on which world you belong and which world you even see. And uh, I just want to break the ice here, though. Uh, the Christian worldview is in stark contrast to everything else, right? They are insane. Our viewpoints are very, very different. It's not like we're debating little tiny nuances here, right? These are insanely different perspectives on our world. And in fact, Scripture, although its claims are, are, claim, its claims, ugh, are laughed at all the time, it has many claims that uh, once scoffed at are now proved true. You know, and we're going to look at just a few of those real quick. Let's just look. Isaiah 42.20, with the earth being round, it says right there, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. That air has weight in the book of Job 28.25, tw which reveals that God imparted weight to the wind and melted out the waters by measure. Jonah 2.6 said there was mountains under the sea long before it was discovered. Uh, Leviticus 7.11 says that the source of, the, of life is in the blood. Um, the earth is held in place by gravitational forces. Uh, that's something that's alluded to in Job 26 when it says that God hangs the earth on nothing, which is a very different perspective at the time because people kind of had this idea that God was either, or some other God, was holding up the earth on their shoulder, on their hands, or some way. And so to say that the earth was hanging on nothing was, not, was a very conflicting perspective at the time. So my point is this. Whether you put your faith in God's perspective, man's perspective, here's the truth. You can't both be right. They're at war with each other, and that much is true. And scripture is so clear on this, you know, I'm not just making this up or, or just hand selecting verses out of here. Uh, this is woven throughout all of scripture. James 4.4 4 clearly states this when he says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. A few weeks ago when I was writing the sermon, a Facebook memory had popped up, and I just thought it was so perfectly timed because it was about this verse that I had written a, a poem or a song about and posted it about 10 years ago, and I, I'm going to read it for you. Um, it's about uh, choosing a perspective that we have to choose a king in this world. Either or, either or. We cannot serve two kings at war. 
either loyal to one or treasonous to both, a sword in the back or a shield of oath, enemy or friend, the defensive wall or the flames within. Do not pay homage to a false king. Do not surrender the field and the forest to his wildfire. Do not be the rust on the kingdom gates. Do not be the opening to the siege, neither the battering ram nor the catapult. It is either one or the other, enemy or brother. You can only truly serve one king, and there is no in-between. I'm passionate about this because I believe there's a lot of us here today and a lot of us out there that are just not picking a side. Now, if you're just now exploring your faith and you're new to all this, of course, that's, that's totally different, okay? You, we all have to have those moments where we, we learn and we decide. But let's be honest, there's a lot of us at one point, or even maybe now, where we're kind of doing the hokey pokey with our faith, right? We've got one foot in, one foot out. Uh, and so uh, I just don't want you to be fooled because Scripture is clear that from God's perspective that upon hearing the gospel, not picking is picking. When it comes to Scripture, we have to pick. We have to commit to a perspective. And I'm not saying you won't have doubts because I do all the time. But at some point, you have to have some faith. And that involves believing. That involves actually letting the perspective of Scripture change you and how you see everything around you. So when it comes to this creation of this world, you know, do you see everything around you as intelligent design, which is 100% undisputable in Scripture, or by the byproduct of some other system rooted in insanely unbelievable odds, 10 to the 124th power, things like that. So you either believe in the odds, or you believe in God, or you believe something in between. Or you either believe in the spiritual realm, and angels, and demons, and all of that stuff, and in an afterlife, or you don't. These things are just not gray areas. These things are, you either believe them or you don't in Scripture. And the reality is, whether you're a Christian or not, if you want the Bible's account, you are between two worlds, two worldviews, two kingdoms. In 1 John 2, 15 uh, through 17, we see this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. My friends, it's, it's crystal clear that the perspective of this world, from God's perspective, that, man, that this world that man has constructed, that it's passing away. Scripture says that this world is not just that it's passing away, that it's already passing away. It's melting away. It's disappearing. It's on its last breath. And so let's just, so if that's what you base everything on, uh, I just want you to understand that under the light of God's perspective, it's passing away. You're building your life on a kingdom of ice. A kingdom of ice. So, Paul in Colossians 2a, he also warns us of this. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. Paul is not saying here that philosophy is bad. Okay? He's not saying that human tradition is bad. He's just saying that if that's what you put your trust and stock in, is man's viewpoints over Christ, you're in danger. Paul urges us to fasten ourselves to Christ. Uh, that's all you can trust. That's all you can rely on. Or take the gamble. Put your faith in man. But if you do, please just understand that from Scripture's perspective, it's passing away. And let's look at this in some Scriptures real quick. Uh, just some, a few that I've selected. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 1 Corinthians 7, 31. And those who use the world, as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and its works will be burned up. Luke 16.17, But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. So, this world is passing away, okay? Sounds like bad news, right? Thankfully, Scripture adds more, much more. You see, if we're between two worlds, right? The one, what's the one that isn't passing? And do you have access to it? Well, for a long, long time, the answer to that was really bad news because mankind didn't really know. And if they thought they knew, they were wrong, like the Jews, because they believed that access to this other world and eternal life was extremely limited to just the Jews. Talk about jerks, right? <laughs> but let's read Ephesians 3. And uh, so, I'm just going to be honest, there's a lot of scripture coming your way, so it might be best uh, for you to follow along on, on here or through the Bible, but we're going to be starting in Ephesians 3, and we're just going to look at what Paul is saying here. So, again, beginning Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely have you, heard, you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I had already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in any other generation as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy 
apostles and prophets. So Paul in this opening, he's blown away, right? I mean, that Jesus is choosing him with his track record. You know, he was Saul. He was a terrorist killing all these Christians, and now he is a Christian. You know, imagine if he walked into church. That would be pretty awkward, right? But uh, Paul is amazed at this mystery that was hidden from every other generation of all time. This great, huge message is given to him. And so what is this mystery? Luckily, it's not a mystery. Paul tells us in the next verse. Keep reading in verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the good news of Christ, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So, the mystery is that this salvation, it's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the apostles or the prophets, it's, but it's for the Gentiles. Now, Gentile just means non-Jews, a.k.a. everyone. You, me, everyone. So, wow, to me, that's not just good news, right? That's fantastic news. I'm glad it's not just for the Jews. And so, keep reading in verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So whoa, 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 let's just stop for a second, step back, because I think we just kind of read over something that maybe we didn't fully understand here. Because what is Paul saying when he says, a revelation was unknown even among the heavenly realms? Well, here's what he's saying. He's not talking about God, because we know God knows everything, right? So he's talking about the angels and the fallen ones, the demons. Not even they were told. Even they wondered, what is God doing with mankind on the earth? Who will be the ones that are going to be saved? He didn't give them the message, right? But what does it say in this verse? He gave, who did he give the message to? The church, right? And God chose the church to reveal this message. Not only did he come down to tell us, he put it on display through the death, burial, and resurrection of the cross. So I just want to ask you, when it comes to your perspective of the gospel, is it the same as Paul's? Is it the same as the angel's? We've covered God's perspective uh, on the world. And when we say the world, that's the system that's set up against God. That's what we mean by the world. And so that it's passing away, right? It's melting. And I think for us, our perspective that the world is uh, passing, it's kind of much clearer than maybe our perspective on the gospel. And that's kind of why we're so obsessed with gain, right? Get as much as you can, live life as crazy as you can, because it's limited, you know, and we get that. But what about our perspective on the gospel? I think our perspective at large among the church, when it comes to the good news and our charge to carry it, it's far from adequate. I think in a lot of ways, we've kind of grown numb to this perspective. And if we've done that, and we've numbed our joy, we've numbed our sense of urgency. We've lost sight of our purpose, of our mission, and the magnitude of the calling that is each and every single one of you in this room today that follows Christ is responsible for. That is, to pick up the torch, to carry the light of Christ into this world. It's not just Dave's message, it's not just mine, it's not just the Bible professor, it's not the missionaries. It is your responsibility. And we will be judged for how we handled this. Not by me, not by man, but by God. But you have been chosen. Please know this. If you're wondering what your calling is, this is your calling. You have been chosen to be the carriers of the most precious message ever delivered to anyone of any time, whether you recognize it or not, whether others recognize it or not. And here's the truth of the reality that you live in at this very moment, as Paul again tells us in Romans 13, 11 through 12. And do this, understanding the occasion. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for our salvation is near now than we, then we, when we, eh. the salvation is near now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day has drawn near, so let us lay aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Our salvation is nearer than ever before. Do you realize that each day we're not gr growing farther away from our salvation? We're growing closer. Scripture defines the last days, you know, you hear these TV evangelists come up, we're in the last days. Well, guess what? From Scripture's standpoint, it's not, this, is not a, this is a fact. We are in the last days. We've been in the last days ever since Jesus ascended to heaven. And the prophets at that time, they kind of had this thing called mountaintop prophecies where they could stand on one mountain and they could see over to the, to the other mountain this prophecy, but they couldn't see how much time was in between in the valley. And so uh, ever since Jesus ascended and sent his Holy Spirit, we have, by Scripture's definition, been in the last days. Uh, so, but statistics show... And I hate this statistic, but I think it's something we need to, we need to be very aware of. Is that 20% of the church does 80% of the work. Proving that statement in scripture true, and also that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So if you look around and you think, hey, you know, everything's good, you know, guess what? About 20% of us 
are toiling very hard, and we could use a break. We could use some others to join in us in this mission. So it sounds like 80% of us are asleep, and I want to challenge you to wake up. Join us. Please help us. Stop coming here just to, get, to, be, to be entertained, to get. Come here to give. Come here to join in this journey with us, to be the torchbearers, to take this earthquaking message of light to the darkest and most dangerous places of the world, to the, to the neglected parts of our community and our people. He is with us. I mean, do you really believe that? And if you do, what do we have to fear? I want you to wake up. I want us all to challenge each other to wake up because right now you have access. Don't think that you can slip in at the last moment, although some certainly will, but banking on that is arrogance. Banking on that is a huge perilous risk. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're going to talk your way into this new world because that's not the picture Scripture paints. Do not leave here and go back to sleep, to be lulled to sleep by the perspectives of this passing and ignorant world. The dreams that you dream... You know, when you're asleep, those dreams are fake. But the dreams that you dream when you're awake, those dreams, they truly can change your fate. And I want to challenge you guys, have you stopped dreaming? Do you look at the sky and the stars anymore? Do you look at them with hearts overflowing with eagerness that today, tomorrow, tonight, could be the day that our king returns, ushering in a new world with him? Revelations 21 says, it, it, it kind of hones us in on this promise of what our hope should be, uh, about this future that we're, that we're all should be just waiting for eagerly. It says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is our proper perspective, church. Our eternity is not some fairyland in heaven forever. That's not what Scripture paints. It's a new, perfected earth with God dwelling visibly with us, with everything that is negative and bad wiped away. Not just that, but we're going to get a glorified body. Hopefully mine will be a little taller. But, uh, you know, and uh, we'll possess eternal life. And I want you to realize that, you know, sometimes when I say eternal life, you're like, I don't want to live forever. Well, yeah, if you're thinking this life like it is now, of course not. But you have no idea of what eternal life with God, with everything like that is negative and bad wiped away could be like. It is a, it is a life that is much more than us on clouds with harps, whatever artists have depicted over the years, okay? It is a life of endless discovery with community with our loved ones, boundless joy, creating and building and worshiping God. That is a, a, that's a future I want. And I just want to ask you, are you fastening yourself to that? Or is it to a new car, a new house, a new job, a new location, a new gadget, a new relationship? I just want you to be clear that that, that perspective, it's a fading mirage from a dehydrated mind that's never tasted the living waters that Jesus offers. I want to encourage you, start dreaming again, guys. Please start dreaming again on what God has promised us. Now, it's not just what we've been saved from, but it's what we're being saved to. And so if you're a committed Christian, if you've made that decision right now, I just want to just self-analyze yourself. Are you living a life with that perspective in mind? And if not, why? Have you went into autopilot somehow? Uh, maybe it was by accident, but are you mindlessly marching to this temporal beat of the earth or to the eternal chance of Scripture? Have you lost focus somehow? Have you lost the magnitude of the vision of the mission? One of the reasons that this has happened in my life and, and happens in certain seasons of my life, it's usually happened when I've stopped dreaming. And usually I've stopped dreaming, either one, because I've been consumed with the world, distracted, but it's almost always happened because I've fallen out of immersing myself in God's perspective, in his word. And here's a fact I've come to realize about myself and about others is that when you fall out of the word, you fall into the world. When you fall out of the word, you fall into the world. But if we're not supposed to set our minds on this passing stuff, okay, what are we supposed to set our minds to? Again, Paul. <laughs> Colossians 3, one through, uh, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Guys, if you truly accept God's perspective, it will change you. I mean, it has to change you. Please realize the power of your perspective because it determines everything. It determines which world you choose and how you treat and see others. And if you truly have the right perspective of the gospel as well, I'm telling you this, it's going to change the way you view God and the way he loves you. 
as the worship team makes their way up here to lead us in worship, you get a chance to commune with this God, with the Son of God, Jesus. We have communion uh, t- at the sides of the room. We have communion tables. Uh, and if you cannot make it there, please, you know, uh, raise your hand and we'll bring, we'll bring you the elements to you. But you get a chance to renew your choice, right? To join the ranks, to join our mission here, to declare that we are at war with the body because we are of the body of Christ. I just shared, so we're crystal clear, I just shared with you this, what from Scripture having a correct gospel perspective is. A correct gospel view means that you see what Christ did for us, what Christ saved us from, and what he saved us to. That Jesus loves you. And it's not with some cheap, feely, unproven love. A lot of times when Jesus loves you, you're like, oh, great. You know, like it's, it seems watered down. You're like almost like a, little, like a little VBS saying or something that just doesn't really have any value. But Christ did not save us with some cheap, unfeely love, but with fierce love. Love like a father who rushes into the flames to save his, his child from a burning home. Love that is razor sharp in its pursuit like a parent who chases after their child who just wandered into a busy street. Love that is self-sacrificial like a soldier who jumps on a grenade to save his friend. Love of a perfect and pure God who sends his only son, no matter how painful, no matter how undeserving, to save his children, to give them a future worth dreaming of. That's a God that I can get behind. That's a message that I can carry. And I just want to ask you, do you want eternal life? Not like it is here right now, but if you do, the good news, the great news is you can have it, but you have to choose a side. You are between two kingdoms, two worlds. To which kingdom are you a citizen? To which world do you belong? You can only serve one king, and there is no in between. Let us pray. Father, wake us up. Father, help us to see the unseen. Lord, restore our sight. Help us to dream your dreams, to give us, uh, to dwell on your promises, to crave our king's return. Lord, I pray that we double down on our faith. I pray that we grit our teeth and we dig our heels in and we sprint past the sinking sands of this world and leap back into your arms. I pray that we get up and we stop fighting for our own greed and luxury in those kingdoms, that we start fighting for hope, for love, for the broken, for the hopeless, God. Lord, protect us from these very, very real spiritual forces that are at work to rob us of our inheritance, to rob us of our citizenship. Lord, be our strength, for I am weary, we are weary. I pray this message was your message, Lord. And I pray that we receive it as a call to arms, Lord, as a trumpet to those who have fallen asleep. Amen.